As officials scramble to deal with the devastation, the Japanese Prime Minister urges people to work together to overcome the challenges they now face. The earthquake, tsunami and the nuclear plant situation have brought the worst crises for Japan since World War II. The Japanese Prime Minister Naito Khan says his country is facing its toughest crisis since the Second World War as it struggles to cope with the devastation caused by Friday's earthquake and tsunami. With the authorities battling to prevent a meltdown at the stricken Fukushima nuclear power plant, a state of emergency has been declared at a second nuclear site closer to the epicenter. The International Atomic Energy Agency is saying that increased levels of radiation had been detected at the Onagawa close to the area, close to the area worst hit by the tsunami. Chris Hogg now from Tokyo. At the Fukushima nuclear plant, they're working non-stop to try to cool the reactors after the systems failed. Radiations leaked out, not at levels that threaten human health, the government says, but many don't believe that. On Saturday, a reactor was damaged by an explosion. Now they're warning there could be another. Hundreds of thousands of people have been moved from the area. But so far, tests have picked up radiation traces on just a handful of them. As for those nine people who tested positive, their clothing and skin are contaminated. It is necessary to remove the contamination. Also, it's necessary to do the health checks of those people to see if they were exposed to radiation internally. We have a report from specialists that if the contamination only stays on the surface of clothing and skin, there will be no health threats. The rescue effort isn't easy. Tens of thousands of people are missing. It's proving difficult to reach some of the worst affected areas. The work goes on as the aftershocks continue. Is it a dream? I just feel like I'm in a movie or something. Whenever I'm alone, I have to pinch my cheek to check whether it's a dream or not. Each new day here brings more evidence of the destructive force unleashed by Friday's quake, the largest to hit Japan in living memory. But it was the wave that followed that overwhelmed so many parts of the coast. For those who were lucky, who survived, the challenge now, how to deal with the damage, to clean up, to start to think about how to rebuild their lives. Chris Hogg reporting there from Tokyo. Well, the Japanese Prime Minister, Nato Khan, has appealed for the country to unite in overcoming what he says is the nation's worst crisis since the Second World War. Speaking on national television today, he urged the people of Japan to help rebuild the nation. This earthquake and the tsunami and also the situation concerning the nuclear power stations are perhaps the hard, hardest hardship that we are uh, experienced after the um, World War II within these 50 years. Whether we as Japanese people can overcome these hardships that is dependent on each of us as Japanese citizens. We Japanese people in the past have overcome all kinds of hardships and were able to create this prosperous society and against this hardship of earthquake and tsunami, we should be able to stand up to them and we believe that we will be able to overcome this. Nato Khan, Japan's Prime Minister there. Well, as Japan counts the cost in terms of lives and dollars, the scale of the devastation becomes clearer every hour, every day. Helen Fawkes reports now with the latest pictures and the latest stories to emerge from this disaster. The terrifying moment that the tsunami hit Japan. The scale of the devastation is becoming clearer two days after the earthquake and shocking pictures of the disaster unfolding continue to emerge. This amateur footage shows the incredible force of the tsunami in Miyako. 
A few kilometres along the coast and the power of the surging water sweeps everything away in its destructive path. As torrents of debris is forced inland, this white bus drives up the hill to escape the tsunami. We don't know what happened to those on board. In Kamaishi, residents can only look on in horror as their small historic city is destroyed. It's believed that the official death toll could rise considerably. It's feared that 10,000 people could have died in just one province. There are scenes of devastation in many coastal areas. These before and after satellite images show the impact of the disaster in the city of Natori. And this is what it looks like inside one of the schools in Natori. Lessons abandoned, now a car is in a classroom. Outside, the school clock has stopped at the moment that the earthquake struck Japan. The authorities are stepping up relief efforts. The number of troops is being doubled to 100,000 and they'll be joined by an additional quarter of a million police officers and other workers. But there are some amazing stories of survival. This man was rescued alive two days after being washed out to sea. Many survivors remain without electricity and water. As Japan struggles to tackle the aftermath of the earthquake, tsunami and a growing nuclear crisis, the Prime Minister has said that the country now faces its greatest hardships since World War II. Helen Fox, BBC News. The scale of the destruction. This is Miyagi Prefecture, where people, police now say more than 10,000 people are believed to be dead or missing. Well, Graham Chave is a translator and English language teacher who lives in Fukushima. And he told me how the nuclear safety concerns have affected the people he's with. Well, today I've just been taking um, supplies up to some friends who've been evacuated from the, the town in which the power plant's situated. And, um, yeah, there's a lot of very concerned people up there. Um, the area of evacuation, they're talking about expanding that. And, um, yeah, it's, it's a concern. It, it's, it's worrying. You mean, a nuclear power plant and, you know, explosions and, and, and things like that, are, you know, it's not a good combination. And, and Graham, you say that you've been taking supplies to people. What sort of situation are, are the people in that you've been seeing, and, and how grateful are they for the sorts of supplies that you're bringing? Okay, okay well, the, the evacuation occurred very suddenly. People were told to basically get in buses or get in their cars and go. So pretty well everybody had what they were wearing, um, and maybe something they could grab in a couple of minutes. But a lot of people came directly from work or from, you know, basically not at home. So... Yeah, people are sleeping on the floor. Maybe they've got a blanket. Some, my, my friend had essentially a thin sheet last night, and this is an area that gets below zero at night. Um, we, just, we just cleared out um, cupboards of, of blankets and old camping stuff, and they were, yeah, very grateful. They were very grateful. Things of clothes. We had a pile of old clothes in the back of the, back of the car, and they were, they were like, oh, please, yes, we're not going to have change of clothes for a week. So, yeah, anything. That was why they were really, really, um, really grateful for that. And Graham, I can only imagine the shock that you've been through two days later. Do you think that people are, are starting to get back on their feet and, and deal with what they need to do to cope with this? In some ways, yeah. It is, it's very surreal just driving back, commenting. It's uh, driving, you know, being at the evacuation centre where people are essentially just living in, in a gymnasium. And then... Um, you know, with, with being fed basically rice balls, just very plain food, enough to keep them alive, just water in there. And then three minutes down the road, you've got kids playing, you know, baseball in a, in a park and people walking the dogs and, and people farming. It, it's, it's slightly surreal. Well, as we've been hearing, there are fears for 10,000 people in the small port town of Minamizan Riku. More than half its population remain unaccounted for after it was practically razed. Our correspondent Alistair Leithhead has just arrived in the small port town. It's one of the most devastated areas. Well, we're in the Minamizan Riku area on the coast, and actually, I'm just feeling a little aftershock at the moment. We're a kilometre from the coast, and behind me, you can see quite clearly where the wave came up this narrow valley, bringing tons of debris with it. What we're seeing here is what was the town that was on the coast below. That's been completely destroyed. We've not been able to get down there yet, although some rescuers have. Um, they're concerned at the moment that there might be more dangers here, so we will have to leave this area pretty quickly. We spoke to people who were in the town or in one of the villages on the coast when the quake struck. 
that they realized what was happening, grabbed what they could from the house and drove out of here as fast as they could. That was within 20 minutes, and at that point, the tsunami hadn't struck. It then came in, of course, and it's very hard to know how many people will have been killed when it destroyed the village and other villages along this stretch of coastline. It is two days after the quake struck, of course, and um, the diggers have just come in in the last few hours to clear a path down so that the heavy equipment can get in there. But it does seem that the area there has been very badly affected. And in fact, in the last hour and a half that we've been here, they found three bodies. Um, so it's a very awkward situation to know the extent of the damage along this coast. But clearly, from being you know, a kilometre inland where I am now, and for the damage to be so extensive this far in, it means that the areas and the coves along this stretch of coast will be r really badly affected, I think. Alistair Leithhead there. Well, the BBC's Alistair Leithhead is travelling around Miyagi Prefecture, away from the region's capital, Sendai. This has been one of the worst affected areas. Thousands are still missing. Well, it's taken us all day to get to this point, and this is just one tiny cove along a vast length of coastline that was affected by the tsunami. And as you can see, it's been how narrow this valley is that's channeled the water up as a wave came from the sea and up here along this road and all the things around it, everything was destroyed, everything was swept away. There's a flat slab there, but a concrete. That is, looks like the floor of a factory. I saw the roof on the other side of the road a few minutes ago. It's gird as bent as if there were coat hangers. And all the way around here, there's thick mud and the wood that you see, that's bits of houses that have been chopped up as the water pushed up about a kilometre up this narrow valley. And you can see how it's concentrated all the debris into it here. We've seen houses, um, obviously, that have been destroyed, little bits of them left, just indicators that there was a house there to start with. We've seen cars that have been crushed as if they've been smashed into a wall. Others buried, one on fire. Um, the extent of the damage, if you look on this side as well, is incredible. It goes a kilometre that way as well. Again, this was houses that were here. You can see the roofs that have just been dragged away. It's incredible, the extent of, of the damage. There's nothing really left here at all. But this is just one part. This is one tiny bit that we've got to. There's many more places like this along the coastline. And that gives you a real sense, I think, of just how big a problem the Japanese authorities have to try and deal with this. And the chances of people surviving in these areas if they didn't get out in time are very slim. Alistair Leithhead reporting there. Well, Tokyo was not as badly affected as the towns and cities in the north of the country. But days on and the capital is still feeling aftershocks. The BBC's Mariko Oi has been talking with people out on the streets of the city to see how they're feeling today. Here in Tokyo, there was relatively little damage compared to the northern part of the country. Nevertheless, people still shaken up by one of the strongest earthquakes that they've ever experienced. This is Roppongi, which is normally jam-packed over the weekend, and it's much quieter this Sunday evening. At least people are now out and about, though, as public transport started to operate again. I was at the top of the staircase at home, and it was shaking so hard that I thought I'd fall all the way down. There are 56 countries around the world which are sending aid and support, and we, the Japanese, are very grateful. People have also been telling me that they're increasingly concerned about the explosion at the nuclear power plant in Fukushima. It's a very sensitive subject here in Japan. It's the only country in the world which has experienced an atomic bomb during the Second World War. And people have been very hesitant and nervous about getting energy from those plants. The government, however, has been pushing it, saying that it's very safe. Today, Japan gets about 30% of energy from those nuclear power plants. But as the country faces shortage of power supply, we are expecting rolling blackouts starting on Monday. Well, for more on the ongoing crisis in Japan, do check out our website, bbc.com slash news. You'll find all the latest news and analysis, including an aerial view of destruction caused by the earthquake and the tsunami that followed it. You can also keep right across the developments. Those shots there showing you the before and after for one particular location. But you can keep right across what's going on with the nuclear power plants. We're talking about five reactors now directly affected by the tsunami and the earthquake contained in three individual nuclear installations. You can also click on the icon on the website that says live. That has a very good drop-down function as our correspondents file updates as they tweet, as they talk on Facebook. You can keep right across all the developments there. 